called some other. I mean, we're going to set it in Texas, but we're not going to call them the common. And just give us six seconds. Ted, one of the things that amused me so greatly about your movie, Who's Killing the Greatest Chefs in Europe, was the fact that I know quite a few European chefs, and I've seen them at work, and you captured so beautifully that hustle bustle, that furor that goes on in the kitchen, and the highly competitive spirit of chefs. Now, is this something that you yourself have had a chance to observe as well? Yes. Well. My, uh, my father and most of my uncles were all restaurateurs, and my mother was a chef. So, and I've worked myself as a second chef in various restaurants when I was in my, in my, my teens, actually. And uh, I've worked in all kinds of uh, capacities in, in restaurants. So I brought a lot of <clears throat> my experiences, my observations from the past to bear on this particular subject. I mean, I've seen, I worked at a restaurant uh, here called The Old Mill in Toronto. And uh, so I've seen how these grand chefs work and the, the slightly operatic quality they have. They're larger than life. They see themselves as stars. And I've seen, I've seen chefs throw plates of food at waiters. They always hate waiters. I, mean, I put a lie in the picture about it. He says, uh, who hates food that much? Is it, isn't it obvious? A waiter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I've seen chefs throw knives at waiters. There's always a continual battle because waiters are always bringing back food that the customers have rejected and, and the, the, the chef feels criticized. And, um, so, and also the uh, very interesting, uh, what you're saying about the jealousy thing that goes on between chefs. Um, I spoke to, we had Paul Bocuse as our technical advisor on the film, and I said to him, um, does it still exist, this jealousy? And he said, it's passing. He said, the old days, the, uh, the great chefs were terribly secretive about their recipes. No one, they, would, they were absolutely paranoid about anyone discovering how they made a dish. But now, with the nouvelle cuisine, uh, the, new, the new approach is for chefs to exchange recipes and exchange suggestions and things that they've discovered in making a meal. So. Their own kind of detente. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Um, another thing, of course, about this film is that there are just fantastic arrays of food. And Ted, I'm just going to have to tell everybody in the audience, Anybody who sees this movie on an empty stomach is going to die in the theater, <laughs> especially if they like good, good food. Uh, what were the problems in having food and keeping it uh, throughout an afternoon or sh shooting or whatever? Well, first of all, you have to make a tremendous amount of food because uh, if you need, say, like we had pigeon on croute, which I think is one of the most beautiful shots in the picture, because uh, that chef, he created a whole bird uh, pigeon, its head, its feathers, its uh, its tail, uh, out of pastry. And is that something he does ordinarily? Yes, as he did. That was his one of his specialities, and it's then stuffed with uh, with minced up pigeon. Uh, well, if you need ten of them, obviously you have to make eighty because take after take, man picks it up, he drops it, the pastry breaks, and they have to look marvelous every time. And of course, as they get used, um, the pastry starts to disintegrate all day long. Um, so the enormous numbers have to be made, much more than you, you need. Actually, we spent, uh, the production manager at the end of the film came to me and said that we had spent $180,000 on food for the picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's some heck of a tip, isn't and it's, it? <laughs> yes, and, and food does, under the hot lights all day long, uh, does tend to start to curl up at the edges a bit, and you need to keep it fresh and continually to make it, I mean, I wanted to really photograph the food with, so that it looks sensuous and, and tactile. And, um, and so we continually having fresh roasts while we're shooting one roast. There was another roast going to be ready three hours later, so it would look absolutely marvelous. Um, and then what became of all the food? Well, I'm afraid at the end of the day, of course, it's, it's, not, it's not edible. Probably be, if anyone ate it, they'd probably contract food poisoning. But we did, uh, there was another uh, uh, shot we did in the Venice fish market when Jackie Bissett and uh, the Italian chef are walking through the Venice fish market. We had about $3,000 uh, $3, $3, of fish, lobsters, crabs, eels, every conceivable kind of seafood. And uh, that, because it was fresh and uncooked, we then gave to various nunneries and charities and poor people at the end of the day. The dessert that Jacqueline Bissett was so famous for, was it real stuff or did you have to fake that a little bit? No, that was a real dessert. The, the recipes for the whole picture were created by Paul Bocuse. 
So the four main dishes. And he actually, La Bombe Richelieu was a complete invention, the name. And he, he created a recipe for it. So that is a real dessert. And it, can, and it consists basically of a, of a kind of a white cake in the center. And over it, they then put a level of, of vanilla, vanilla buttercream, which was frozen. And they put fresh raspberries all over it. Then they put a level of strawberry, I uh, know, raspberry rather, buttercream. They freeze that. And then a level of chocolate buttercream. So they kept being layers and layers and layers. So basically, that's what it consists of layers of vanilla, raspberry, and chocolate. And finally, on the outside, there was a marzipan coating uh, with a marzipan crown because it was baked for the queen. Yes. And then the whole thing was flambé. Flambé, exactly. Yes. So it, it was absolutely delicious. Actually, we had a, uh, the, uh, he made it. Uh, Bocuse made it, and we had a big party, and we tried to eat it. We couldn't finish it. It was enormous. It weighed 50 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, it was, I, I was very lucky um, that Bocuse and a lot of the other chefs allowed me to stay in their kitchens for a whole evening. I, and I spent from 6 o'clock in the evening to midnight just watching them. And so that, because I wanted to, I wanted all the kitchen scenes to have a tremendous degree of accuracy and verisimilitude. And you get wonderful ideas by watching actual people working. Yes. Ted, you have a project that you're going to start working on very soon. You're making the movie version of the book Dallas North 40. And um, at this point, even though you haven't started, are you going to be pretty true to the book, do you think? Yes, as much as it is possible to be. Uh, the book is a very subjective book, and uh, a film is a very objective thing. And some, uh, but yes, I'm going to you know, try to try to stay as close to the book as possible. I, I love the book. I'm, I'm very excited by shooting in Texas. Uh, I've, always, I've traveled extensively through Texas on a, on a holiday. And uh, the Texans, to me, I like as a director making films about people like Texans who have very strong characteristics that distinguish them from other, from other Americans. And they certainly are a distinctive group of people. Uh, as that great, uh, there's a book written about them called the Super Americans, and that's what they are. They are Super Americans. And I love also the, the landscapes. I love the flat landscapes of Texas. I think that. So I'm really, uh, I'm really gearing myself up for this film. Um, I think it's a very good book. Uh, I think it has distortions in it, I don't know, but uh, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, shooting it. Mm -hmm. How do you think the Texans, and particularly the Dallas people and the people who are Dallas Cowboy fans, how do you think they're going to take to this? Well, I, I gather that the, the, the Dallas Cowboy organization didn't care for the book very much. That's putting it mildly. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but we're, we're going to make it a more imaginary team because I'm not out to get the Cowboys. I love the fact that I'm a big Dallas Cowboy fan. I've always been a big Dallas Cowboy fan. I think they're a fantastic team. And uh, however they get there, they certainly have, have certainly turned football into uh, a wonderful uh, championship sport. Um, I, was, I was a big supporter of them last year at the Super Bowl. In fact, I've liked the Dallas Cowboys ever since they first came into the game. I think they play wonderful football. So I'm not, and the film is not out to get anybody. And the film is about an individual against the system. Uh, and it's, it's going to be very funny. I think there's a lot of funny characters in it. I hope I catch some of the kind of racy atmosphere of football. But, and you uh, have Nick and Nolte. it's going to you know, we have Nick Nolte is going to be the star of it, and uh, so uh, I don't think the Dallas Cowboys need fear anything from me. <laughs> Was there ever a time when you might have uh, tried to cast an ex? pro football player, somebody like Don Meredith, who was Dallas Cowboy quarterback? Yes, well, I think we're going to use, obviously, a lot of, a lot of, real, cow a lot of real, rather, real cowboys, a lot of real football players, uh, because you just can't get that quality, the size and their attitude. And I hope that, and a lot of them are, they're, they are performers. They go out and perform in front of a lot of people, so they have a natural kind of exhibitionist quality. And a lot of them, like O.J. Simpson and uh, Jim Brown, of course, have gone on to become actors. So um, I'm looking forward, really. And also, I think if you reuse the real players themselves, they bring a lot of experience. They tell you, the, they say, hey, they, we don't do that, or we do this. And they also, they they're a fund of funny stories, which I've, I love incorporating in my films. Well, Ted, we'll look forward to having you down in Dallas then. Me too. And thanks so much for talking with us today here in Toronto. Thank you, Bobby.